One series, one show, has run now for so long, it's the apocalypse. Hi. Hi. We're recording this episode during the UK lockdown of 2020. Isolation. My name is Chris. I am not Chris. And we're here to talk about Doctor Who season... What season is this? I don't even know. I can't remember. What season? 15? Is this 15? I've lost count. I've actually lost count of what season we're up to. If you don't know, I certainly don't know. That's worrying. That's worrying. But give, give everyone the bullet points of the key things that happened this series. Minnie! Minnie, don't, don't rub your butt on the floor, don't rub your you sicko. your butt on that carpet, little bean. That's not one of the things that happens this series. No, it did. It did that just happened right now. Yes. Um, yes. We, it was the Doctor and Leela Aye. on this series. Um, we've moved away... From the gothic themed Season stories. 15. Um, so. Yeah, it kind of hangs around a little at the start of the series, the doesn't it? Yeah. And then very quickly dissipates. Um, yeah, there's some amazing moments. One being in this first story. <laughs> and there's some absolutely horrendous, shocking. Stinkers. One would say. The worst story one has encountered yeah. so far in this marathon of ours. Yeah, it's, it's nearly giving break for jobs working away from home, nearly two-year marathon. Wowza. Wowzers, get couches. Social distancing. So, uh, let's get started then. By the way, Ghost T-shirt number three. Yes, yes. This is the only other one I have, because... We're in lockdown and I don't get paid enough to be able to buy another one. And this is a black t-shirt. This one is extra cute because the cardinal is holding a little rat. He's not under the cardinal hand. though, is he? He's a cardinal in this in this picture though. He is. Much like the Doctor and Leela are absolute goddamn heroes in... If you want to sponsor me, you know, that's fine. Go for it. Yes, because I'm sure the band goes to watch it. Mind you, they're on downtime during lockdown. Exactly. Uh, the Horror of Fang Rock. Ah! What happened to the horror of Fang Rock? Not Chris. Um, they end up on a little island that's got a um, lighthouse on. And something entered the sea, didn't it? Mm, so it crashed at sea and the, uh, yeah. the keepers spot it. And the lighthouse keeps going off <laughs> and they're having to sound the horn because a fog has appeared just super, super quickly out of nowhere. Um, and it's as thick as... as, as Jelly brains. Oh, thicker. Um, thicker. There we go. That's our, our <laughs> for Christmas quota for the day. Um, That just goes to show what kind of couple we are, though. <laughs> we can just start a quote from anything that we've not even talked about for months and months and months and just finish it. That's what we've established whilst we've been at home together. We have problems. We do. But, um... Uh, so the keeper, Ben, is killed. Yeah. His body's found by the doctor and Leela. Uh, they get back there, and there is the other keepers, uh, Reuben, the old superstitious bugger, and Hawkins, the younger guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hawkins is like, this is exactly like the, the beast of Fang Rock. Yeah. Well, there's a beast that allegedly kills people on the moors of Fang Rock. Um, uh, and then um, a ship ends up crashing. <laughs> yes. Containing um, pompous rich people. Yeah, Hark is the bosun. He's the, he's the like you know the, the good egg of that group. Yeah. Uh, Colonel James Skinsale MP, uh, who, who's uh, who's basically like funding the whole thing and yeah. uh, whose secrets could be outed at any minute by uh, his uh, younger contemporary Lord Palmerdale, who's a twat, and his secretary uh, Adelaide, and they are brilliant. Like, yeah. They are so much fun yeah, to watch because they're, um... they're in their own story. They're in their completely own separate story of scandal mm -hmm. and blackmail. And they're annoyed that they're that they're there because um, one of them, which one is it? That's he's got, he's got some something going on at the Lord um, Palmerdale. Yeah. At the oh god, I've just forgotten what it's called. It's like in the trading. Yes, there's a stock thing. A stock thing. Right. Yeah, he's got like a. Oh, hello. Um, something's banking on him being in London at a specific times, so he's being a douche trying yeah. to get to London you, you get the not sense caring he owes, about everybody you get the sense else. he owes money to people maybe yeah, and yeah. he's in a lot of trouble because they've been on a casino thing haven't they and they're going to take the winnings back and that's where he's uh, why he's, he's strong and everything and it, it's all basically there's a lot of tension The people stuck in a lighthouse who don't want to be in that lighthouse mm -hmm. after one of the lighthouse keepers 
is found dead by the Doctor and Leela. Who, the moment they arrive, are like, sum it up. And it's both of them. The Doctor is like, yeah, no, this this Leela is explainable, that's on. And Leela can sense it. We get a big thing in the few stories this series of her instincts. Like, because the Doctor always just says that she's all, she's all, um, in, she's all instinct. Like, that's all yeah. she is. Because she's a savage. She's a savage. I hate that he um, calls her a savage. Well, I, I originally it was more term of endearment, but like under Graham it Williams is like the, is it Graham Williams the script editor this year? Under Graham Williams is producing it. The Doctor seems a lot shorter with Leela this series. Okay. Um, yeah, got a little bit. Well, no, okay. Right. He seems a bit shorter with Leela this series. Yeah, um, I'm not a fan. But these two, their performances are as endearing as ever. They're very entertaining. Louise Jameson's a goddamn gift. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, her instinct serves her well in the first few stories because it, she notices stuff before he does, and he's almost too pompous to admit it. No. Um, and then, no. yeah, there is indeed a creature out there that's crash landed, and it's it's killing them off one by one. It's using electricity as its like main source of attack and, and energy, mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. it's assessing them because mm-hmm. it turns out it is the first of a potential invasion fleet looking to use the Earth as a base. Mm-hmm. Um, for a like thousands of years long conflict that rages throughout time, a war which we are familiar with and have been spoken about uh, has been spoken about in the show before. Um, we never see this war in the show, classic mm-hmm. or modern, as mm-hmm. of today. Mm-hmm. But we finally meet the opposing side. We've already met some Tarans. This episode, we meet the Root and Host. Um. <laughs> Big, blue, big green blob. Yeah. Big freaky green jellyfish blob thing. Yeah, it was... Um, Were you expecting that to be the enemies of the Santarans? No. Um, something that reflects a lot in the whole series is... I don't know what's going on, but the special effects seem to have gone... Well, not down so much as they're relying a lot more on visual effects over practical effects now. Mm. And I imagine for for seventy seven seventy eight when these stories were going out, these were pretty damn good looking on on a small screen like in the living corner of a living room. These would have been really stark and ex- and exciting things. Mm. Um, but they just they haven't held up, and as a result, the older stories look better in in comparison. Yeah, they do. I mean, like, John, even John's even series even looks better than this series. Oh yeah, well yeah, because that's the that, those are the years where they start experimenting with CSO and chroma key, mm. green screen and blue screen techniques, but they don't overdo it. Whereas this series really overdoes it quite a lot. Yeah, it really does. Um, like I would take, I don't think the rootin, for example, looks that bad in this one. No, but they they, they shoot it well. They use the Eldritchian horror of this jellyfish. I and think, they're not in a turn of the century lighthouse, yeah. and they they frame it well, like at the corner of the stairwell. It's yeah, I think quite it's really important intruding. that it's on a spiral staircase. Obviously, it's in a lighthouse. Mm. If it were in like a flat room, it would look shocking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It would. It look odd. So that they, they the setting helps it yeah. stay creepy, and the fact that they've chosen to make the root and look a bit like it's a shapeshifter, but it's mm. it's it's like host body is like a jellyfish. So yeah. it kind of is like okay, all right. It would fit face. into normal society's you know yeah like it, it, it feels like part of the story things. the same way that the killer robots in uh, voyage of the damned are these golden angels in the in this titanic recreation that's meant to be all resplendent and respectable it's got gold and wooden livery everywhere and all this that and the other so the angels in that story don't feel that out of place because they just look like garish decorations like everything else that's there they fit in in the same way that this jellyfish fits into a seaside horror story. To be completely honest, though, if I got on a ship and I saw those things, I'd have, I'd, I'd turn around and walk out. And what, the information? Does, yeah. yeah. Absolutely not. If if I was on a ship with with robots that can walk around freely, not, like, in a set place like animatronics in Disney, I know. No, I'm not going on that ship. What's scarier? You, you can't pay me to go on that ship. What's scarier, the angels from Voyage of the Damned or the Vok from Robots of Death? From last series. Which ones are they? Please do not throw hands oh, at no, me. Oh no, they're kind of cute. Them? A, well, well, yeah. well, D84 maybe. I think, I think... He's back there behind us on the shelf now. He's permanently moved into the shelves. Yay! Because he makes me smile. Them. 
He's no, I think he's alongside an Auton and uh, Paul Condon, the Jadoon from season and twelve. And teeny, teeny, teeny tiny adipose. But we'll get to them when we get to them in, <laughs> in four three years. years. Time. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're an absolute daddy's girl today. You're not interested in me, are you? You little wench. But no, I think the um, Voyage of the Damned robots are much scarier. Okay. Much, 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 much scarier. How could just was... FYI, I'm scared of robots. How scary was Horror Fang Rock for, for the like classic Doctor Who we've been absorbing? Would you say it was um, tense enough? It was tense. I think, I think again, the setting made a massive difference because they're isolated from anything. They can't get out. They can't see anything. Even little kisses. Um, <laughs> they can't see anything because the fog is so thick. Um... And also, it's in um, oh, a, a time period where you can't ac- access, you know, communication not... with people <clears throat> easily. I mean, there's the, um, the telegraph, the telegraph, and the um, Morse code kind of yeah, thing, which gets broken. Yeah, and, and yeah. It, it, yeah, so it's and their only they... form of, of getting in touch with people is destroyed. And by morning, we may all be dead. Like the doc, you can tell the doctor is reveling in the mystery of this. But he also is very well aware of how serious it is, yeah. um, which is made more difficult when Adelaide starts getting hysterical. Can we talk about your favourite moment of Doctor Who so far ever? Wow. <laughs> this was spectacular because it was just so... Hey, it's over. We rewound this <laughs> about ten times. Yeah. She What's her name? Adelaide. Adelaide, Adelaide yeah. starts screaming because somebody's died or something's happened or... She's got to sleep on the floor or something like that. At least where they um, announced that uh, the, the, the bosun's dead. Right. Yeah. Um, and she screams. And Leela absolutely... Sm- <laughs> she smacks her in the face. Open palm smack. Holy crap. It was so funny because I was not expecting it at all. Whereas somebody <laughs> knew it was coming and knew it would make me laugh. I was just watching. So was watching me. <laughs> um... It's the way that it's so abrupt, like it shuts her up because they realise it it's a shock but thing. But nobody does anything. No one reacts. Nobody reacts. <laughs> Which kind of makes me think, did she just do it? Was it just like not even part of it? No. She's de- just sick of her and just slaps her in the face. Louise Jameson is, Louise Jameson is, Jameson is kittens and, and rainbows. She would not just randomly slap someone in the oh face. Oh my God. So God funny. That made, this is the best episode. <laughs> this, sorry, this is the best series. No, this story is the best the story. Series. This is hard. This is the best story in this series. It's a horror fan Purely rock. because of that. And also because it is it is keeping oh, with the gothic kind of thing. It bally well is. It bally well is. Did you enjoy it? I like the horror fan rock a lot. The horror fan rock is one of my favourites mm. from Tom's run. Uh, which is why it's so heartbreaking to carry on with this series really because it is the high point and it's the first story. As far as we're yeah, concerned, you'll find out. The Invisible Enemy. Um, ah, there's a virus. Oh no! Oh my god! Killing people from within, attacking them, corrupting their minds. There's a space station who get taken over by it. It's basically a hive mind. It, it's a virus as a zombie plague, uh, and they're all like wired in. They're all part of the same thing, and they have the same goal. They want to take over as many people as they can, including the Doctor who gets infected. So uh, they manage to get to this planet where um, the, the ship, which is a medical ship. Uh, where they meet at Dr. Marius. Um, get his name right, because he's a lovely character. Continuing on with our... Uh, Professor Marius, yeah. Continuing on with our lovely chain of professors who are inexplicably German. Yeah. Uh, Which, you know... Who basically surmises that the best way to get the virus out of the Doctor, because the Doctor is waking up in little bursts of consciousness, mm-hmm. um, the best way to get the virus out of him is to send the Doctor and Leela into, into the Doctor. Him, yeah. At this point in time, there is temporary cloning technology used for like brief experiments to test out medical theories and whatnot, which sounds horrifying. Yes, when it you, does. Yeah, now you Because you know exactly what they really use it for normally, right? Where it's just like... Okay, let's, no. no. <laughs> let's see if this amputation will work without killing them. Clone them and then we'll cut the clones up. Yeah, it's like, that's... But they don't get that grim in this. No. So essentially, Doctor Who does the fantastic voyage. We get it the does, Doctor yeah. and Leela inside the Doctor's body trying to get rid of this virus. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So the science comes back in a bit. We get a bit of stuff about how the brain works and everything. Um... The idea of the doctor a, has lots of bridges in his body. He bloody does. The <laughs> idea of a sentient virus is quite creepy. Like, you, like you don't normally have intelligent zombies, and that's basically what everybody infected by yeah. it becomes mm-hmm. until they develop a cure. 
Uh, but two notable things about this story. One, it, well, well, three. The title's amazing. Yeah. The Invisible Enemy. Yeah. It's about a virus. Which is great. That's not what your brain immediately goes to when you hear that title. No. So that's great. I like that a lot. Two, it has the worst third act uh, reveal of a villain. Yeah, it really does. Because the costume is cool. The choice to light it in bright studio lighting and view it in wide like wide shots, dreadful. So the, the Doctor and Leela defeat like the core of the virus, which is, is housed in the Doctor. It needs a strong brain to basically get its claws into as, mm-hmm. as a hub. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when they go in to retrieve it, it uses that, once the clones are dead, to come out of, of the Doctor like as, as like a reverse of the, the shrinking technology. Um so then, essentially, the virus is a being in our world, and the main infected are going to help it and mm-hmm. get it into this thing that's going to spread it even further. And it's like, that's a great idea. Problem. The virus looks like a transparent prawn. It does. <laughs> it's obviously modelled after, like, real viral strains and parasites. Is it? Yeah, because when you see it in the Doctor's brain, it's not that bad. It's this hulking, it's like- shriveled thing. It's this... Mound that's Sorry, that's, these that's all right. It's this little mound that's like freaking out and quivering in his brain, and it looks freaky. And then it comes out, and it's a performer on the knees, shuffling, yeah. and they choose to shoot. The direction this series gets shocking in some places, like really bad. The alien. If you've seen the alien in Alien, the xenomorph, the the big chap, as it's called in the script. No, it's not big chap. Yeah, they refer to it as the big chap. All the toys from NECA have recently stopped calling it the Xenomorph and started calling it big chap. I have no idea why. Um, But, oh, careful. (laughs) Tom around. I'm so sorry. You're virally infecting his brain. We'll have to use the D-Man gun on you. Um, The ratio from history. Robocop, get him. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yeah, like, the Xenomorph is a terrifying design. But if you see it in full lighting and you see, you know, the seven-foot-odd performer walking around in it, it's a little bit goofy in a way. It's like, oh, that's a scary costume. Oh, look at him walking around in daylight. That's really funny. Mm. Which is why you never see it in broad daylight or fully exposed. But walking ever. as a person. Yeah. yeah, you see this creature the way the film wants you to see it. And this virus could have been could have been really creepy. It could have been. I mean, like, why, if, if, if they just put it in to, something. They didn't have to show it. If I they just think. put it in something, like it was weak as soon as it's out and exposed, they like put it in something. All you can ever see of it is it's just like its claw or the end of its face. Like it needed to like be a kept in wall. like a tube kind of thing. Like, 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 like the capsule that he tricks yeah, it into yeah, at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. That would have been creepy as sin. It's like the the four five six. I don't know. I don't know how much you remember Torch with Children of Earth, the, the special from two thousand nine. I don't think I've the four five six. The aliens that come to Earth, and you know, all the other see of them really is they're in this tank mm. in Downing Street. They're in this tank, and it's filled with this gas. What is that's it? uh, it's a tank, and it's filled <laughs> with this gas that is that's the, you know the atmosphere that they can breathe in. Yeah, and you only ever really kind of see a shadow of them. They just sort of look like these sort of like they're like bird heads but like they're sort of fleshy and you never see them properly you just hear their voice and and you see the shadow and the movement of them and it's so effective because to this day it's like yeah i don't really know what it looked like but i know it was creepy and that's what this could have been yeah Mm. the one big bloody plus of this story ladies and jenny spoons is our our friend and yours introduction of a character that you were really excited to meet and i don't think he disappointed this series did he uh tell him a little bit about professor marius's little robot chum professor marius (laughs) is on this ship and he misses his dog so he made one and it turned out to be little little kato and he's and he's very clever he's very helpful um, he has lasers and um, a waggy tail. A waggy, yeah. And satellite dish ears, which based on the story move properly. Yeah, it was kind of annoying that. And John Leeson's voice, and um, he's just very sweet, isn't he? Oh, good gracious! I see. I I love I, I love dogs. I just love dogs. They are the purest creature on this planet. And it melts my heart. We could be having a serious conversation, which has happened many times, and I'll just say, dog, if I see a dog, mm-hmm. 
and uh, Christopher sends me pictures of dogs just cause, just to make me happy. Having a little robot dog in a show that we've been spending two years watching has just refreshed my love for it completely. Not that it was like dying. It just maybe dwindled. It's that new element. Yeah. It's that new little element of wait, there's a robot dog in it. Holy moly! Did you just say dog? Let me in. Um, he's very cute, and it, uh, we've been quoting it. We quote it all the time, just saying affirmative, mm. always. And the only thing I've ever seen of Canine is um maybe seeing the odd episode on UK Gold or whatever, um and Sarah Jane Adventures. No, just, yeah, he's Sarah in the Jane Sarah Adventures. Jane, he's in the Sarah and Jane Adventures the, on and off. Yeah, the episode with David Tennant, um, with the, the Tenth <laughs> Doctor in the school. School reunion. What are you saying? School reunion. Reunion. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> oh my god! On the tin dog. Or Mickey. Yeah. Um, I, do you know what? Is the is my is my favorite companion? <laughs> Sorry, Barbara. Sorry, Sorry Barbara. <laughs> Screw Sorry. you, Jamie. Sorry, Joe. Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> Get out, Vicky. Invisible Enemy is pretty fun. Crumbles at the end because of yeah. the effect of the costume. But we were blown away by the fact that it was another one of those things where it, where it links into now. Oh, like yeah. The virus thing happened. It was just before, it started, it was just before like, Corona like, oh my God. became a thing that the country was actively trying to deal with. Yeah, but it was obviously on the fringes and we all knew about it. It was like... Yeah. Oh my god, it's about not a virus. About weeks ago, yeah. Uh, what we also watched nearly uh, mar- two weeks ago now is Image of the Fendal. Uh, it's Image sort of, of it's sort of the third Image in a trilogy of, of Pyramids of Mars, mm-hmm. Seeds of Doom, yeah. and this one as three Tom stories set in priories with a gothic horror premise. I'm all down for that. And creepy shit going on inside the priory with an alien with an alien it- intrusion. Just, encroaching on have, the existing society. Where are all these huge, like, Victorian mansions with massive, like, sacrifice basements? Well, they all burned down. I mean, Pyramids of Mars, remember they go there and they're like, oh, this is Unit. Oh, but it's like 30 years too early. Hang on, oh, this, this is the oh, priory that burnt down before they built Unit HQ. Oh, God, it's better set that fire. No, Pyramid- you know, where, I, I don't want one of these houses. Pyramids of Mars is the strongest of this trilogy. Seeds of Doom is a very close second. Mm-hmm. This one's sort of like the Return of the Jedi, as in, as in, as in, there's a lot to love. There's a big practical effect puppet slug, <laughs> but not that much. But it's not that goes on. Really. It's anything. There's the barely any canine. It's almost like they went, oh, not this week. Um, now to be fair, it does have Mrs. Tyler. Yes. The batty old woman. Yeah. Who's into like the old ways. Um, she's a fun character, and whenever the doctor's interacting with her, it's a lot of fun. I'm, I, I love, a, I love a curmudgeon in yeah. this show. A curmudgeon, what yeah. a word! Because if when they always cast it well, they always cast like grumpy old men or women perfectly mm. in this yeah, show. Mm-hmm. The curmudgeons are always a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and she's great. Mm-hmm. And I think the researchers, especially uh, the lady, let me double check her name. The lady who gets possessed, she plays it really well. Um. Because you actually feel her confusion, and then the really unfortunate side effect at the end of oh, and she's gone now. Like she's just a host to this she thing, just... to the Fendal, the Fendi. Um, of course, you've got you've got uh, Doctor Fendelman, who you think might be the villain here, mm-hmm. as, as there's clearly mm-hmm. something trying to pass through yeah. to our time, and you realise later that no, he's just an ancient like descendant of the people who initially found them and whatnot. So the Fendal, uh, the Fendi, and uh, we feast a Fendi. Um, uh, I don't know what he's talking about. They either. are a a Gallif- Gal- <laughs> I'm going to say it properly. Gallifreyan. Gallifreyan. Uh, they are a Gallifreyan um, nursery rhyme. They're they're a, they're a, a monster under the bed. They're a boogeyman mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. the Gallifreyans' like distant past. Um, <clears throat> and their connection to Earth is apparently due to the fact that millennia ago, a Time Lord came to Earth in something to do with these creatures, because the skull has been found predating human existence yeah. by millennia. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a Time Lord skull, which is a cool idea. It's like, oh shit, a Time Lord came to Earth millions of years ago for something, and whatever's happening now is using that skull as like a conduit? Mm. Wow, okay. 
Um, Fandal rock up. These hideous, like, uh, sluggish, maggoty creatures with, with, like, spaghetti tendril mouths. See, I thought that <laughs> looked more like a parasite than the bloody virus thing. It's, it's sort of good, isn't it? They kind of combine, like, like a cobra and a, and a, and a, and a leech. A leech? They've got, they've got yeah. like, they've got, like, the, yeah. the squidgy leech body and the weird mouth, and they've yeah. got, like, the hoods. Yeah. Like a cobra. And really gross. <clears throat> there's little ones that possess people. Doesn't it hiss? Uh, so it makes this horrible kind of gurgling sound, doesn't it? And, mm. and the, the, the clacking of, like, the things in its mouth flopping around. And, and, if, you lo- and if you look at it, you you become paralysed with fear. Mm. Not in, like, a, I'm scared of it, but in, like, that lizard part of your brain just... Shuts off and refuses to cooperate. Is lizard? Yeah, the lizard. Yeah, the lizard brain. The the we have our mammalian brains. We have our lizard brains. Different video. What? Um, but it sure. it freaks out, and your whole body just kind of like stays on the spot and it mm-hmm. won't listen to yeah, reason yeah. because it's just freaked I mean, out by even, the presence. Uh, I mean, Leela's not scared of anything, and she she couldn't move. Yeah, um, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like what's the what's the Sarah Jane and Doctor One with the not Sarah Jane and Doctor yeah no the Sarah Jane and Doctor One there's there's one where they're in the forests um oh god no uh monster so I can't remember Planet of Evil Planet of Evil <laughs> well whenever that invisible creature was like there like the one that was like the chroma key red shapes oh, yeah. and whenever it was around Sarah Jane just she just was paralyzed on the spot and couldn't move it was kind of the same thing as that oh, wasn't right. it like the characters yeah, were guess. stuck still yeah, yeah. well. Yeah, like they, they can't just, move their feet. Yeah, and it's just this overwhelming sense of, of dread that meant they wouldn't. You want to move? Shift. They can't move. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, almost. This has done better in Seeds of Doom. It feels like there's more stakes in Seeds of Doom, mm-hmm. with the uh, the crinoids like growing out of the building and and the guy throwing people into the freaking compost machine. Like it feels like there's more stakes in that one. Uh, and when when it you seems- find out the Fendel can be defeated by Sol, it's sort of like. <laughs> That's it's it's simultaneously it's, it's simultaneously brilliant, but also like oh, uh, that, how did you oh. get this far? <clears throat> yeah, not having any cancel. But can I just ask what was their what was their prime objective? Uh, Take over the world colonization, probably. Where, uh, how boring. That mm. see that's that was what pulled it down for me. There was a lot. There was so many cool images like the wasn't it the Fendal. Mm. The, the gold, the gold. Oh yeah, she saw idol. She had a very she, kind of, like uh, turns into. She had a very kind of axon like. Yeah. yeah, with the eyes painted on and everything. Looked amazing. And the the culty worship circle. Yeah, exactly. Like the pentagram <coughs> thing. And you got some really. Good, you had a really, really good point cast, Doctor Fendelman, Max, yeah. Thea, Colby, especially. Who basically oh, spent the entire thing? Led? Was it? Was the um? It's the occult. I call them occult. It's just talk, it was so basically funny. just talking like Matt Berry's character from yeah. Garth Marenghi's yeah. Dark Place. Yeah. Look, if you and he want to be buddies again, I won't stand in your way. That, like, why are you exactly, talking like that? Exactly. That, that, he must have taken. He must have seen that that story, and then Matthew, I know how to pitch it. I'm gonna do it like this, chap. Probably, and then just oh, early came Matt in. Berry. His pointed finger. I like current Matt Berry. Just saying. What are we doing in the shadows? That's Toast of London. So. What are we doing in the shadows? Yeah. What are we doing in the shadows? What, what places is this ritual? Which I started saying <laughs> because, of the, because of the goddamn ritual scene. Right. Uh, we're um, gonna... But yeah, anyway, <laughs> that, so that was, so there was really, really great elements like the skull, um, like hypnotising you almost. It was really, really cool. Yeah, gothic stuff worked. Yeah. But it just, it felt, Pyramids, Pyramids of Mars isn't particularly gothic, but it's scary and the villain is frightening. Mm-hmm. Seeds of Doom is full on gothic, mm-hmm. and it really revels in that. Like mm-hmm. they're gonna uh, make Sarah Jane the su- su- test subject for the seed, and mm-hmm. then when the doctor gets infected, the, the, the professor and he's like, "You're gonna leave me to die." Oh, no, it's like this is horrible. Some liver. Yeah. Um, the fact that it starts with who goes there, it starts with the thing in an yeah, Arctic yeah. base, like yeah, it's. Yeah. It's really spooky. This just feels a bit weak sourcing. Like comparison. it tried to kind of copy that kind of theme, but didn't make it. It was very weak sauce. Yeah. But it looked nice. First one of the stories where Leela's in the tiny skimpy outfit, which is an even skimpier version of her actual attire as well. Good golly grief. Good golly, good golly I hope she's wearing briefs. Uh, Doctor Who versus the Taxman. Uh, the Sunmakers. 
for those who don't know, uh, Pluto, Earth Colony, one of several, uh, the company are in charge of everything, mm -hmm. and people have to go along with it, and the people who work for it, and they get overcharged and overtaxed like crazy, and what to what end? There's they get the rich, taxed for being taxed. There's the rich uh, NPs, basically, who are like running it all and living it large, and then there's the creepy dude overseeing them all. Uh, what's he called again? It's his bloody name. Uh, the Collector. There's this spooky guy overseeing it all. Uh, spoilers, turns out he's there's an alien race involved in the creation of the system. He's mm -hmm. one of them using yeah. like a disguise. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to take over Earth. They're just trying to rule over everything yeah. and steer it in their money, way. Money grabbing, power hungry. Race. Yeah, it nearly opens. It opens with a near suicide when a lovely character we're introduced to in the opening five minutes is going to kill himself because he can't afford his father's treatments. His funeral. His father's funeral. Yes, yeah, father's funeral. That's it. Um, just it's it's bleak. And it's obviously a dig it's at... so <laughs> obvious. And now, not to say that's not enjoyable. There is something very cathartic and fun about watching a story that's basically saying, aren't HMRC a bunch of bastards? Yeah. Aren't, aren't your MPs a bunch of twats? We're going to take the piss out of them in this story. Like, that is great. The problem is, it's toothless. Mm-hmm. Oh, aren't they stupid? Oh, aren't they stupid? Oh, aren't they stupid? Are you going to make a point? No. No. It's just like uh, rise up and make a rebellion. Create a rebellion because it basically becomes Robin Hood. Yeah, but Robin Hood has swords and bows and arrows and well, shit goes down. Well, these these people, people get these people workers. get arrested and imprisoned and put in the stocks. Oh, she got sneeze. <sighs> um, that was adorable. Thanks. Um, I do do wrong. Was say. Oh yeah, they were don't because it'll get monetized. <laughs> um. The workers are told they can't go outside because they don't have that privilege. They mm. can't afford it. Um, so when something good happens, they tell them that they've created another sun. Yeah. So they, hence. Yeah, it's like we're rewarding you with more heat and energy. Isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? But you can't go outside and see it. <coughs> and the doctor's like, eh? Pluto? <laughs> another yes. How many suns? Was it like six suns? Yeah, I think that's six at this point. Yeah. like, eh? What? <laughs> um, well, so the doctor already knows that it's fishy, but... Yeah, I mean, this, they're, they're amazingly eccentric characters, which I found quite enjoyable. And there's some really good dialogue in this one. Some really good, witty, yeah. funny, bloody yeah. dialogue that is, like, legitimately enjoyable and silly. Tom is, is having a ball. Um, Louise is being given a lot more to do in this one. Mm -hmm. She's a lot more hands-on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the very kind of, like, just, uh, you know, sort of, oh, 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 well, you know, it's just... Awfully, awfully ashamed, but this is just going to be how it's going to be from like the bloke who's going to be killed and have his brain erased because yeah. everyone's just sort of like, no, this is just how things are. It's like, oh, no, yeah, this isn't just how things are. Up in that sleeping bag thing. Yeah, which like the doctor's escape then isn't an escape, but he still did something to sort of yeah, facilitate yeah. it. Um, like, there's a lot of fun to be had in the Sunmakers. It just ultimately feels like it's like being told that like, oh yeah, this is the hottest curry on the menu. And you're like, oh, I can't wait for this. And then you eat it, and it's really tasty, but the thrill of you picking the hottest one is diminished when you go, yeah, I feel all right, actually. Mm. Like You kind of want it to be like, oh, it nearly got me. Spicy, oh, it nearly spicy. defeated me. Yeah. Bloody hell. Oh, go on, I'll have one glass of milk. Like, you kind of want that. You want you want that little extra, like, oh, go on then. Mm. It was worth it, mm. you cheeky buggers. Mm. And it just doesn't, it feels like the Sunmakers doesn't It feel, felt like that. it had like a, a great build-up. Yeah. Hey. And then it just fizzled. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like the sons of Pluto. Concluding in the amazing shot of the, what is he, the collector? Um, shrinking down. Shrinking down into like a his toilet chair. Yeah, because the effect looked great. And then it, it opened and we were like, oh. Oh, that's a shame that they ended the shrinking effect with like a prop going through a little hole in the bottom. And then they revealed that, no. He, He's still in there. He shrank and then it was a little thing going down. Because he's underneath, like, in whatever form it's really in, which is, like, I think the doctor describes it sort of like a mass of nerves and and tendrils or whatever. So it's like, yeah, yeah okay, let's leave it in there. Yeah. But because it looks like an airplane toilet... It is. That's, it's like, you know, it's in the toilet. Someone's flushed it out of the plane. So it, it, should, it should have had, like, the <laughs> flushing sound effect. That's exactly what it looked. Fine, but, um, just fine. It was fine. Yeah, yeah, just fine. Just fine. Fun to be had, but... 
Yeah. Uh, you got your point across, whoever wrote that. Sort of. Uh, the writer was uh, Robert Holmes. Lovely Robert Holmes. Not one of his finest. Lucy. Shall I sum up the plot and then you tell them what you thought? Can you sum up the plot? Was there a plot? Yeah, it is basics. Uh, there's a race called the... What they called again? They are called the Minyans, the Minyan race, who the Time Lords aided in their early days of development. Uh, that was the early days of the Time Lords before they had their no-interference rule and they helped this society survive. They even taught them the secrets of partial regeneration where they could rejuvenate their bodies to a younger, mm. healthier state to help them carry on you know, developing things and creating. Uh, eventually, they learned space travel and told the Time Lords to piss off. So the Time Lords were like, oh, all right then. Yeah, and then they went away and came up with their rules of non-interference and blah, 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 blah. The Minyans lived on and a ship goes out into the middle of nowhere to find a new place for their people Colony to survive. Ship. Yeah. yeah. It goes missing. So another ship goes out to follow them. And a 100,000 years later, that same ship and that same small crew are looking for them. Mm. And... They're regenerating at the end of their natural life cycle, like they've been put in this chamber and being rejuvenated back mm. to a younger form, and to carry on with the mission. Oh, we must finish the mission. Is it the mission or the quest? The mission. It's the mission. Is it? We must finish the mission. Doctor and the Doctor and Leo arrive there, and they're like, "Oh shoot! Okay, this artifact on it proved that this is that society the Time Lords knew from thousands of years ago, but they're still here. Oh, you're looking for your people. Let's do it. They get through this like." Difficult period in space, like it's at the edge of a Milky Way or, or a black hole or whatever. Mm. <clears throat> and they end up in a place where their ship starts to get covered in debris because it's the heaviest thing there. So its, so it's, it's centre of gravity starts latching rocks and debris to it. Mm -hmm. And they manage to get out in time, but they, they find this planet, which is basically the other ship. Yeah. That obviously arrived here hundreds of thousands of years ago. And it is now a planet because the ship is there instead of a core. And the main society live within a tunnel network around the core of the planet. We never even find out there's anything on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they live down there. And over the years, it's been developed into a society of aggressive law keepers who are dressed in these like medieval sort of chainmail uh, executioner outfits. Huge shoulders. Uh, who've got pompous members. Members who are a bit more kind of like, you know, the ancient ways, we'll do this and this and the other. And then they've got the people working for them, the subservient lot, who are every bit as entitled to a proper life as everyone is, but they're being subjugated. And it seems like the ship's computer may even have had a part in this and, and created this divide. So essentially what you've got is a time travel story where our time travellers arrive way too late. Mm -hmm. That is a great setup for a story. It's a shame it's utter shit. It's garbage. Why is it garbage? Hit them with the facts. It's extremely boring. There's so many characters and you're like, who are you? What are you doing? What's the point? <laughs> what is happening? This, why, you, this, why do this, you all have these hairstyles? This man holding this woman here makes it look like something like dangerous and some kind of rescue happening. No. She da is like dying and so needs to be mm -hmm. going regenerated. And she's, it happens within the first like 10 minutes. Yeah, episode. and she's just somebody that was just one of the crew. And it's like, oh. See those dudes in the metal helmets? Yeah, we don't, we don't really get that either. Who? They're, they're, they're part of the oppression ones. Yeah. Are they robots? Are they sent? Are they sort of robot-human hybrids created by the computer? These these facts are probably in the story, but I'll tell you what, we were tuning out. Switched off completely. I'd seen this before, and I remember being bored, but I couldn't remember anything else. Mm -hmm. So when we put it on, I remember saying to you, like, I don't remember good things about this one, but I also can't remember why I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. It's just the Don't know what was going on. The direction, the, the pacing is it's, awful. Oh, so... The effects the CSO, are shocking. Yeah. Absolutely shocking because now, they're again, in we'll tunnels. Get, now, groundbreaking maybe for the time. It, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, but it's what they're yeah, but, doing. What, John, what they're doing in 1978 in this story with those sets, which are partially real and mostly chroma key, the caverns and everything, what they're doing here is the exact same as what, say, like, and forget the quality of the overall film here, but like, look at the effect, as what like George Lucas is doing on like the Star Wars prequels. It's like, that's impressive. You're creating whole worlds out of nothing and you are putting your actors on a minimal set and you are pushing that world into the visuals so they get to, they can play anywhere. The problem is, they're playing in caves. They've got four established shots that they keep using as different sections of the cave. 
And it's like the... I was trying to describe it to our friend Guy when I was saying why I found it really boring. It's like... It's less... Oh my God, these effects are incredible. And what a story they're telling. And more... Aren't these effects incredible? Let's keep showing them to you for three episodes. They don't look incredible, though. If you think back to the John Pertwee story, I can't remember the names of stories. I'm so shocking with names, so don't sure. think that I'm not enjoying it, but I am. Um, <laughs> we are 15 seasons in at this point. Where the 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 ship arrives, and it's essentially a, a creature, and the, 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 the so-called human creatures inside it, like, they attach to the ship again. Remember the pink fleshy thing? Yeah. Yeah. And that I mean when they were in that ship when it was all fleshy inside, that looked amazing. This looked like we were talking about it, it looked like a shocking student film. Because there's a moment where um the doctor, <coughs> Leela and some guy, I don't even know who he was, going down Cut Ankle Man. Yeah, going down this I don't even know, was it a tube? I don't know. They sort of they sort of go down this this chasm. That's like electromagnetically whatever. They're floating. And the way they do it is like the doctor basically shows them if you go in and you literally just make slight motions, you direct up. It's like swimming. It looks like the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, sorry, the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, mm-hmm. f- uh, fizzy lifting drinks yeah. sequence, mm-hmm. if done on a budget of £20. Exactly. I mean, Leela is, bless her, the actress is leaning against something and kind of doing the. Ooh. Oh, Louise is good. Louise and never, then, never not goes for it. By comparison, Tom's phoning it in. Tom stands there. For the entirety there. of this story, yeah. bar about two scenes. I don't blame him though, because it's terrible. But he stands there and he just moves his scarf a little bit. That's all he does. <laughs> and at one point, <laughs> and when he just looks down like, twice. "Yep, there we go. There's the floor." Yeah. Uh, oh, look at my feet. Um. Look at we go. I guess. I suppose. Can I go to the pub? I want to go to the pub. I'd rather have been in the pub. Is he the first doctor to yeah. phone it in? I don't think. I don't think. I mean, Billy questionably phoned it in a couple of times in the sense that he literally was like, "I need some time off." But also, in hindsight, we know it's because he was very unwell yeah. and genuinely needed time off. Mistress. But like, he had a lot of holiday time. Tom doesn't have any holiday time, but he's obviously shooting a less grueling schedule than William and Patrick were doing. Mm. But he's also in this story. I've never, I've never noticed it before. But in this story, he's. He looks bored. Yeah. And he isn't doing anything to elevate the story. Yeah. And I think it's because he knows the script is dog shit. I might have to watch this DVD again soon. Mm. Because the commentary for this DVD features Tom. I will watch that with you. And I am fascinated to hear what he has to say about this. What was the outcome? Dunno. What was the point of the story? Dunno. Oh, they have the. Uh, they find the. It becomes alien covenant because they have like. Oh, this is the genesis of, of the rest of our species. Here are the genes. Let's go. Oh yeah, let's get them all on our ship. And, and um, the, the two. Go- yeah, and it's like. Oh, they've actually given us grenades. Right. Well, I've got the real ones. Go back and give them the real ones, and they will blow up the computer. Yeah, there was a woman's voice. It was like, who are you? What have you got to do with it? So. <laughs> What's going? Are we this still? Be, this could be someone watching Jesus. this who loves Underworld. Who's like, you, you don't get it. It's like. No. No, don't. we don't. And that's the problem. The story was not in. Get- that premise I described at the beginning. I would love to watch that yeah, story. Yeah. This did that, apparently. Yikes. But you couldn't tell. Very um, boring. Possibly the worst story, in my opinion, that we've encountered although when Tom, on our journey. And when the Doctor has a go at the computer, you can see he's still got that thing of hating computers. Oh. And the bit at the end where he basically tells the, the ship's captain, like, no, listen to me, you twat. These you are, are your taking people. these people with yeah. you. Don't say get off the ship because you're going to take off. You, you, you're, the whole thing is to protect your people. These are your people. Mm-hmm. That was great. Those are the two bits in the whole story where he's, he's engaged. Uh, Louise Jameson is the MVP of this series because she's always going for it, even when the script, the script is giving her sod all to do. Mm-hmm. But she's always going for it. And that we really appreciated, especially as we move into the final story of season 15, The Invasion of Time. Uh, or as I like to call it, four episodes of really intriguing daring um, mis- mystery mm-hmm. followed by two episodes of the Sontarans being shit in a leisure centre. <laughs> that is uh, so accurate. It hurts. In case you're wondering why there's a Sontaran on the table, folks, the Sontarans are in this story. Or are they? They are. But it's a surprise. Mm. And we'll get to that. Um, <clears throat> this starts sort of in media res. 
It doesn't give you any explanation. We yeah. just see that the Doctor is meeting with this mysterious cabal who are signing a deal with him where he's going to be given absolute power over Gallifrey mm-hmm. to help them in their conquest. And he's not letting Leela know what's going on. And he's obviously told K-9 the basics. And then he goes to Gallifrey. He's like, I'm Lord President, by the way. And Gallifrey like, oh, shit. I, yeah, we, I guess you are because you're invoking a, 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 a gap in the cause of everything since the events of the Deadly Assassin, mm-hmm. and you're filling the gap. Okay. <clears throat> right, my first decree is, I want to be made the president now. I'm going to talk like crap to everybody. I want my inaugural like celebration room to be coated in, in lead. Mm. Like traditional... <clears throat> it's like Earth, it's sort of like industrial sense. revolution of Earth and all that, and they're all talking about, oh, how quaint. And he's like, yes, but I do like it, and I want it done. I do it now. <laughs> I believe now. And then he suddenly orders uh, Leela to be uh, exiled mm. out of Gallifrey. And you're like, what the hell is happening here? Um, yeah. Turns out it's all part of a scheme. This, there's an alien invading force that want to take advantage of Gallifrey, and they're, they're obviously looking for someone to do it. Uh, what are they call it? They call it the Vargans or something like that? The Foilmen. The Foilmen! The Foilmen! Um, they, they keep looking for... They're obviously looking for a way in. And they've got hold of the Doctor and he's seen the window to be like, right, I can stop. Like, someone who is corrupt is going to take up this offer. So I'm going to I'm gonna outthink them. Um, and, you know, that's a great idea. Like, it, it, it takes the, the viewer on a ride because we have no idea. The Vardens, that's it. We have no idea what the hell is going on yeah. from the start of the story. Um and the only giveaway in episode one is like this moment where Tom like screams, like tells uh, the Chancellor Barusa to leave and everything. He leaves the room and it closes in on Tom's face and he sort of goes from being like angry to looking sort of, God, I hope this works. Concerned, like his expression yeah. is just like, yeah. and you're like, oh, the doctor's planning something. Uh, and he wants Leela exiled because he wants her out of the Citadel while this is going on because she's in danger. So it I turns like out. Word, Citadel. It's a yeah. good word. Turns out the Vardens, uh, the species, uh, want to take over Gallifrey they are like telekinetic they, they can read minds and influence minds mm-hmm. um, they're very uh, they're very to the point they're very um, Hurry up, get vicious this yeah they're impatient mm. and the reason why the doctor's taking this job on is because they vicious well they're, they're, they, they don't Insistent. they don't suffer fools yeah uh, uh, <clears throat> but they don't kill anyone do they, they, they the, guy, the guy that does that's the main voice of this foil creature is we'll um, <laughs> it sounds like he is <clears throat> filling in. It, it, it sounds like it's the voiceover on set before exactly, they add the dubbed voice. Exactly, that's exactly what I was trying to describe. Oh my gosh! It, so, it sounds like when David. Bit. It sounds like when David Prowse is like, "You remember the Rebel exactly. Alliance and a traitor," and and yeah, you've seen <laughs> that. Have you seen that? We've seen those footage. That footage. Yeah, yeah. So good. God bless the internet. Um, uh, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it seems like, and they just didn't dub it over with anything better. <laughs> but then you, when you see them, you're like, "Oh no, that's that's him." Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That, uh, yeah, yeah. So the Doctor is doing business with him because he can sort of scramble his thoughts and be distracted just enough to like stop him from reading his mind completely mm-hmm. as he sets up their demise. The lead room is to block out their mental transmissions. Um, he teams up with Chancellor Barusa, his old teacher, who we met briefly in The Deadly Assassin, mm-hmm. uh, who's completely baffled and insulted by everything that's happening. And then the doctor tells him everything, what's really going on. He's like, oh my God, you're up. You you know what? You might have been the rogue. You're the black sheep in the class. You were the rogue member, but damn it, doctor, you are very good. Like, I, I admire this. And I like, pre- you didn't trust me to, <clears throat> you didn't trust, you didn't trust me to tell me? And he was like, no, because they would read your mind. And he was like, well, he was like, and well, he tricks I- him and he's like, well, you're right. <laughs> well, yeah, because Bruce, Bruce is like, no, I, I could block their fingers. And he's like, no, you are very, the doctor's like, you are very, you are very single-minded. You are incredibly clever and incredibly smart, but you are functional. You are, um, what does he call it? It's sort of like you are, you're focused. Mm. You, you focus on one train of thought and that's how they get in. Mm. Whereas I'm scattered as anything. And he sort of proves it by like distracting him in yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, Bruce goes, yeah, you're right. You've got a point. Yeah, like, I, I would be completely like, yeah. like un- under there radar like in their radar immediately mm-hmm. and they'd be mm-hmm. able to suss me out mm-hmm. meanwhile you've got uh you've got the castellan who's who's a new castellan i'm sure I, the actor was in the last one isn't he i think so but uh, he, but he's not he's not the he wasn't the castellan last time no the castellan last time was the was the really cool guy he was like had the security and helping the doctor figure out the the assassination area 
But this guy's a chancer, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to... I see my... I don't think he's the same character. I don't think it's the same character. I think it might be... I think it, I'm sure the same actor appeared in it, but I might be wrong. I'll double check. Castellan Kellner, he was in this. Um, yeah, he's the guy who's in The Empire Strikes Back, and he was... Uh, he was Mr. Rossiter in the Basil Brush show, do you remember on CBBC? Yeah. And his character was a rip-off on purpose of Leonard Rossiter and, and like... Cringe! Yeah. <laughs> uh, but kind of watch clips from Basil Brush show from 2009. No, they made jokes in there that you would never... I'm surprised it got away with then. Oh, it's really weird. Like, remember his cousin... His cousin uh, no Monty idea. or something? Like the guy who was no the little, little bruiser, the little like, the really tough one in the leather jacket. In one scene where he takes over the house... There are girls walking around giving out like stuff, wearing barely anything. There are people gambling. There's a bloke with a gun on the table and he's smoking. In like There's a, a two thousand five show. Table with a gun. Oh my god! But so the Castellan is is like he sort of sees an opportunity to maybe become president here. Yeah. Like he even ropes in some of the guard, one of the guards, to be like, right, you're going to be the president's security guard. Don't let anything happen to him. Never let anything happen to him. Because if that happens to him, I have to become the president. And I don't want that burden on me. Not yet. Do you understand? The guy's like, yes. You're like, Sneaky oh, okay. So there's already, there's a pa- since there's been no president since the deadly assassin, there is power struggles going yeah, on yeah. internally. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Gallifrey. And this sort of really shows uh, up Gallifrey's, what? Gallifrey. Yeah. Gallifrey's uh, sort of, you know, bureaucratic, pompous, you know, the, the stuff that makes you realise, oh, this is why he ran away. Mm-hmm. He was like, I want this. What the hell is this? I want to go out and see the universe. ran away away. <clears throat> You're dangerous, it's ugly. So, um, there's that side of it all going on. Leela tweaks with the help of, I'm trying to remember her name now, the lady who she uh, joins forces with who's like, she didn't get the position she wanted. Rodan, she didn't get the position she wanted uh, from the Academy. She's she's a Time Lord and she didn't get the position she wanted. Mm-hmm. And now she's helping like just navigate like the ships Traffic. that come in and out yeah. of Gallifrey's That's atmosphere. So yeah. She hates it and she and uh, Leela team up yeah. And they bugger off into the thingy because she figures out, hang on, the doctor's doing this on purpose. He wants me out there for some reason. Mm-hmm. I think he wants me to help rescue him. I'm going to get out there. She meets like the people living outside Gallifrey mm-hmm. like, who've, been object- who've been rejected from the Citadel, mm-hmm. who've kind of become a, a, a warring tribe. This is where Gallifrey's history and, and communities and everything start to get a bit confused. A bit because the stories go on, they kind of don't... I think they're called... The, I think, is it the Shabogans? Is the name of the Gallifrey and people who live on the outskirts? Uh, like, remember in the Twelfth Doctor, you just saw Hellbend and you just the once the Twelfth Doctor finale where he goes back to Gallifrey and like he goes back to the hut where he, that he grew up, the one in Day of the Doctor. Did it and have there's his people Clara there, they, in it? Yeah. Um, no, 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 all right. I okay. Don't recall the reason why the timeless children like they talk about this Shabogan woman from Gallifrey. Yeah. This was called the Mon series. Uh, who like goes out and just learns, discovers, and meets the child. Like Shabogans yeah. are sort of yeah, like yeah. I think they call Shabogans. They're called they're, they're these people who live in Gallifrey who are more like hermits, nomads. They live yeah. on the outskirts who don't do the citadel stuff. Yeah, they're yeah. not time lords because they didn't do the academy. They're yeah. just Gallif- Gallifreyans. 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 And um, <clears throat> this sort of implies that these guys have become like that. And Leela leads them, and they're like, "We're going to go back. We're going to save the Doctor." Not knowing the reason the Doctor sent her away is the same reason he, he couldn't tell Barusa earlier. Mm-hmm. Leela is all instinct, mm-hmm. and they'd see like if he told her what was going on. They'd read it in her mind immediately. By the end of episode can't, four... Can't even keep her imprisoned. Do you mind that? Yeah, because they... Because they, they, yeah. she'd realised what was going on. Yeah. Because of her instincts and... Yeah. So by episode four, it's resolved. Like, they get rid of the Vardens. They, yeah, they, it, got they get to, rid of them. it got to a point where I said, <clears throat> I said to Christopher, oh, have you nearly finished now? And he was like, no, it's a sick... Pa- sick six part. It's a sick parter, man. No, it's a six parter. And I was like, oh. It feels like it's wrapping up, though. Because it, it does. It, it finishes. And then the Doctor's like, no, do you thank me? And this, that, and the other. And everyone looks past him in sort of yeah. shock. And he's like, what? What is it? And he turns around, and the Doctor and the viewers see at the cliffhanger of episode four, bunch of Sontarans stood mm. in the uh, panopticon. I've got to say, I was pretty shocked. Yeah, you went, what? I was like, did you know this was a... Because I what? purposely did not... Leave the DVD like facing forward, like there was usually, there was no because obviously slap bang in the middle of the DVD cover. We usually have a bit of a thing <clears throat> when we're going into a new series, just before I'm going to bed or like going to the bathroom or something. Christopher will stop me and tell me. It's not me, my fault. You're always going to sleep or piss. 
<laughs> Good job, not at the same time. Hey, Yet. sometimes. Uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, and he'll show me each DVD that we're going to be watching and what it's about. But he didn't this time. I didn't even clock that he didn't do it's it. It's because I remember this twist. I've had this story since what, 2007 when the box set came out. Um... Because it comes the hell out of nowhere. It does, like, what? And then you realise what's yeah. happened here, because the only clue is that during the traffic sort of stuff with Rodan, there's mention that there's other ships on com- uh, incoming, mm. and you assume at the time that it's these things beaming themselves down. Well, then in episode four, shortly after they've already arrived, there's just the shot of a ship coming through the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And that's the only clue that there's something else going on. And then the Sontarans rock up, because it turns out the Sontarans want Gallifrey. The Vardens did too, but the Sontarans knew that, set them up with a, with a link. They were like, right, there's this person called the Doctor. He's a renegade. He'll probably give you what you need. There you go. Knowing that the Doctor, based on what they know of him, would probably defeat, defeat them. the yeah. Vardens. Can I just say? We... But it, it weakened the barrier enough that they were like, right, in we come. Because the Sontarans want control of time. Mm. Because they want their the war to either be cut off at the root or because of their military might and number, they want to be able to spread their, their, war, their war effort throughout time so they can yeah. defeat the Rutans and then fight back any other enemy that happens to try and step up to them. We didn't point out sorry, <coughs> that the Rutans, um, Rutan Tootan Rutans, <laughs> uh, appear as like little foil people. Oh, the Vardens. Sorry, the Vardens. Yeah. Well, the Rutans, of course, were in the first story. There was a Rutan in the first story. So we bookend the series with, with Sontara and Rutan war villains. Weird. Yeah. Um, Where did I get Rutans from? Sorry. Anyway. That's right. Um, uh, yeah, they appear as like little fo- foil things and they're very loud. Because that's the problem. They're, they're these shimmering they objects awful. before they reveal themselves to be sort of like uniformed soldiers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when they're shim- these shimmering objects, it's a chroma key effect. Clearly, it's just the, the, an image cast over the screen. And it would be fine were it not for the fact that to do the electricity sound effect, they've clearly just chosen to record the sound of the foil that they're using. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like foil. So when you see fo- right, so if you saw foil moving and you heard an electricity sound effect, you go, "Oh, that thing's made of electricity." Mm. But because they're they're using just the sound of foil moving, which sounds a bit like electric current, so, tin foil like rattling sounds a bit like electricity. But because it's the exact sound foil makes when it shakes, you're just looking at it going, "That's foil. Really That's loud. foil. Um, That's tin foil." And then when they showed themselves, it was like, "Oh, oh. they're just dudes in in suits." The, 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 the crap space marines. Mm. Like, all right, okay. They didn't look threatening. Well, then these guys, their slight redesign is pretty decent. Like, they're bulky as hell. They've got, like, proper, like, pumped up upper bodies. They look a bit Michelin man It's sort of like Buzz Lightyear. I've just noticed he's got little heels. <laughs> yes, he does. Um, Wowza. Sometimes I rock up and they're like, right, where's the doctor? We're going to kill the doctor now because the doctor is the only one who can get in the way of this. But what we're going to do now. Because he's, the president has been chosen, the doctor's got all that stuff, so we want him. And we need to get the, was it the Sash of Razalon, the, the Rod of Razalon, the uh, Crown of Razalon, which is, gives you him knowledge of the, the Matrix, Matrix, which is what the Sontarans want access to as well. Mm-hmm. And the Key of Razalon. But the Key of Razalon did not show up at the ceremony. And it turns out the Key of Razalon hasn't been used in the presidential um, inauguration for generations. People think it's a myth. People think it's a myth, but they still sort of say, like, the key of Razalon and present nothing, and, and you know, mm-hmm. cause it's part of the ceremony. He realised later that in Razalon's wisdom, because he realised the key of Razalon had access to too much power, mm-hmm. um, in his wisdom, the, the key of Razalon has been gifted to whoever the Chancellor is. Uh, and hide it. And they to hide it. Um, so Barusa has access to it, and he eventually gives it to the Doctor, because the Doctor's like, no, seriously, they will come find it, or they'll come find you and make you reveal where it is mm-hmm. to them. Give it to me. We're going to go on the run with this. Uh, and with Rodan's help uh, in the echelons of the TARDIS and K9, who is more p- participatory in this story, um, they craft the DMAT gun, which sort of comes the hell out of nowhere in the last episode. But the DMAT gun is a dematerialization gun, harnessing the power of Razalon. And when fired at something, it erases it completely from time. You're like, it's a bit extreme, isn't it? But then you realise really. this is a, yeah this is a fleet of like four this is like a scouting party of four Sontarans including Store, and they have to be taken down now before the rest of the fleet knows it's safe to come in mm-hmm. and Gallifrey can't fight back against yeah. what's about to descend on because they've not put their shields back up. <clears throat> so the thought process is 
if you take out at least Store with the DMAC gun, then he's gone from history, which means he never had this plan, which means this plan never happened. Mm -hmm. And that way the Sontarans don't know to attack Gallifrey because that plan doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, harsh, but cool. He's trying to protect all of reality. I harsh, get it. but cool. Yeah. <laughs> um... <clears throat> Episode 5 kind of sets that premise up a bit. Mm. Episode 6 is them all just running around rooms in a leisure centre in a factory oh. and, a, and a hospital. Oh. We get Switched to see <laughs> we get to see the interior of the TARDIS beyond the console room mm -hmm. for the first time. We see the pool. Yeah. In episode 1 when you see the pool it's like oh that's kind oh, of cool. Exists. Like leaves are swimming in the pool. This looks like froggy inflatables. This is adorable. <laughs> but then it just keeps going. Mm. And it's so the most the, Oh, I like the idea that the TARDIS has got different interiors and they're not all the same room with just different things in it. Uh, in Peter's time, you'll see a few more rooms in the TARDIS. Like, you'll see bedroom and living areas for the first time since um, Hartnell's era. Right. Where there was, like, you know, you yeah, saw, like, extra sleeping. rooms, sleeping quarters, yeah. and, the, and the room with the food uh, the machine and everything. The like, water thing, yeah. You know, the, the, uh, you, see, you see a lot of them in Davidson's era. <coughs> and they're sort of extensions of the console room. Because mm -hmm. you see, like, Tegan's room and stuff. Uh... Uh, and I'm not expecting every room to be the exact same pattern, but the fact that in this, the first door out of the console room, you've got on screen, you can see the, uh, you can see, you know, there's, there's the, the doors that open out into the world, mm -hmm. console, like, viewing thing on the back, the, 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 no, whatever it's called, the kind of... whatever the bloody screen's called, mm. and then you've got a door here, the Doctor and Leela go in and out loads of times throughout the series. And then we see it from the other side of the door when the Sontarans go through into the TARDIS. Which should feel menacing, but it just feels plodding. And it's just like a utility cupboard. Mm. And then the next room's a hallway. And then it's a, an empty swimming pool. Yeah, for some reason. And then it's another empty swimming pool. And they, they make a joke out of the fact the Doctor is like, right, we need to go this way, we'll get this done. And then it's like, you don't actually know where you're going, do you? He's like, no, I do. And then they stretch that out for ten minutes. Yeah, it's... it's and it stops off. being funny. Yeah, it's switched off. Uh, in, like, minute two. Um, it's odd. I like the head of the guard, the guy who's, like, the heroic mm -hmm. character. He's mm -hmm. played really bloody well. I like the fact that the, 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 the Galfrain guards all have that, like, Super that look. And that carries on. Yeah. Like, you'll see many an actor, including a future Doctor actor, playing one of those many, characters many over the course of, of the next few years. Mm -hmm. I like the design of the guards. I think it's quite cool. Yeah. It's very Flash Gordon. It is. It um, is. Absolutely. I like the Time Lord robes. Like there's enough variations in it all. Barusa looks different from the Castellan. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Rodan, she's got a different kind of outfit, but it still fits the aesthetic and the two bitchy Time Lords and everything. Like, the looks nice. The Panopticon looks different how it, to how it did in um, Deadly Assassin, but in a good way. Like, it's bright. The set is brighter. And yeah, you can see yeah. more of it. There's no action men hiding in telescopes. <laughs> Um, but just the last part is just so last two parts just so dull mm. which sucks because the last two Sontaran stories were pretty great mm -hmm. Time Warrior one of my favourites from the yeah. classic era yeah. love it Iron Gron like you know you've got all that stuff and, and Link's the Sontaran who's great and then the same performer plays Steyer um, Field Marshal Steyer in Sontaran Experiment two episodes straightforward mm hmm astronauts tortured mm -hmm. it's on tower experiments pretty creepy it's great four fingers for some reason whatever this guy is so bad he doesn't sound very menacing he sounds very cockney which would be fine if it was aggressive like if he was going if he was going like Ray Winston kind of just like really gravelly talking yeah. like this you'd be like really wow but he good. sort of goes for mock Danny Dyer yeah that faux hard man thing, mm. and it just didn't didn't suit it. The he's... way they look. Oh well, his mask especially, yeah. He his, looks his, like his, um, the the, the Sontaran head. Other Sontarans, I think, look like a potato. Mm. This one looks like a baked sweet potato. This one looks like a a thumb after an hour long bath. And you've just smudged a load of black makeup around its eyes. Yeah, and its mouth. And he's been told what? right. So the last guy, he sort of did this thing where he like sort of licked his lips. And it was sort of creepy with the last two Sontarans because sort of, it was sort of like this, the, the tongue would just sort of gently come out and sort of, it was almost like it was smelling the air like a reptile, mm. wasn't it? It was just sort of like, you know, a little, like, hello, sort of like a, like that. Yeah, and it was just it a was little... very funny, the first shot of him. But yeah, yeah anyway. but, that's, but it sort of felt like it was part of like their physiology. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this guy is just going randomly. 
I said, what are you doing, mate? That sounds gross. Why are you doing that? It's, it's but he's bizarre. like staring as he does it. It's weird. And he's staring off in weird directions. And every time he says doctor, where is the doc tour? Every time. That was a really good impression. Though. Thank you. I've had years to perfect how much I hate the way he says it. It really, really, really got Store is the worst Sontaran so far. So oh, no! Sontar. Oh, no. Ha. Oh, no, um, that's not good. Put it this way. I don't think the next performers are worse than him, but they are very miscast, oh, as you will see in about a year's time. Oh, dolly. <laughs> so, unless during lockdown we fly through. <laughs> like oh, really? a year's worth of dog too. We can go outside now. So. The emotion of time starts out really fun, uh, and then just to and then ramps up. Oh. It ramps up the excitement, and then delivers flatness for two episodes. Yeah. It if if that last two, if those last two episodes had really knocked it out of the park with surprise, sometimes the real villains, and here's what's going on. It would be really cool. It would absolutely be the best story of this series if that was the case, because then you'd be like, it was just a really cool thing, and the Doctor's being weird, and this, that, and the other, and oh, this were revealed, and then, oh, brilliant, it saves the day, and then there's two more episodes in the Sun Tower into the real villains. Oh, my God. Like, that would have been, it would have been great. Mm -hmm. Terrible for the last two episodes. It was disappointing. But you had fun with it, if I remember correctly. Yeah, the amazing yeah. time. Uh, the K9 was a good boy in it. He was a good dude. He was a very good doggo. And then he stays behind at the end, because, of course... We lose Leela in the last story Leela, in the invasion of time. She stays Leela behind. She stays back for a man. For penis. Why? She stays back for that penis. That was never referenced, really. I mean, they had a connection in the, in the first couple in of episodes. Story, but it was like. It comes out of nowhere. What? And it, it's made worse by the fact that her working with the tribe and her being a badass and teaching them how to fight. I would have thought she'd have gone with them. She would have stayed to be like, I'm going to stay with them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That would have been brilliant. Mm -hmm. And it just feels weird that it's like, no, it's for a man. And you're like, oh. Um, and then you realise, oh, that's been a thing. The Doctor leaves Susan with David because he's like, you need a life of your own. Yeah. And they do clearly have this set up in that story, though, that they've got a thing. Yeah, yeah. Remember he sees it a few times and it's like, you can you can tell he's like, yeah. oh, she needs to get away from... No, no, I need to I need to stop being like She's this. and a woman. <coughs> a woman. Um, like, Joe, you know, like, naturally falls in love with yeah. Professor Jones and it... Yeah. It works. It feels a bit quick with the marriage proposal, but it... it you then sort of remind yourself, oh, it's a kid's show and it's a more simplified version of the complexities of them making that connection. Mm -hmm. And also the way that Katie Manning and John Pertwee plays it's heartbreaking and it's yeah. so well done. It just sort of feels like it's another, like, oh, this one has met a man, which is what she needed. And it's like, it's not what Leela needed. Leela needed a beast to slay yeah. and an electric guitar to learn and <laughs> just thrash metal her way through life. So that her departure was quite disappointing. Leela, the 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 real life wish list DLC character for Brutal Legend. Mm. Imagine yeah. her Brutal Legend. Leela and Brutal Legend oh, would have yeah. been badass. Brutal Legend, God, what a long <clears throat> game. Anyway. <laughs> um, good soundtrack, though. Yeah. Um, so we lost Leela and we lose K9. Sort of. Because it turns out, for some freaking reason, well, K9 decides, K9 chooses to stay, yeah. and the Doctor's like, oh, stay with his mistress. But then he respects it, and you think, okay, new angle, the Doctor's going to be on his own. And then he pulls out a box saying K9 Mark II. Where did he get that box from? Where did he get a second K9 from? How does he. Professor Marius gave him a K9. What? He gave him K9. Did he also? He did he somehow K9. sneak a second one in there? He kind of lent. Has the Doctor been secretly building a backup one? And why would you make a box for it? Exactly. It, it says... looks. It looks like a flat pack. It looks yeah, like you can build it. It's from IKEA. It's if odd. they do sell them in IKEA, can we get one? And then yes. And then Tom laughs down the barrel of the camera, and we all go, "Ugh, a bit creepy." Um, not even the sonic screwdriver can get me out of this one. So. <laughs> I like Tom and that story. Horror Fang Rock, The Invisible Enemy, Image of the Fendal, The Sunmakers, Underworld, and The Invasion of Time. Best story? Horror Fang Rock. Horror Fang Rock. Horror Fang Rock. Worst story? Underworld. Oh, good grief. Oh. Um, yes. Are we sad to see the back of Leela? Yeah. However, going back to a point we were making before, I, I do think the Doctor was too mean to her. It's de definitely the scripts. Uh, and you can see he at the end, at when he lot. says goodbye to the door, he says, I'll, I'll miss you too, Savage, uh, the, on the other side of the door when he's leaving. The way he says it doesn't sound snappy. It sort of sounds like he's got some genuine affection of like, oh, I'm kind of miffed that this is this is ended now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but... 
Like, but it's it's an odd one. Tom, not Tom. The Doctor is very snappy this series. Next series, he is given a new travelling companion, given a new travelling companion, who's there to call him out on his shit. Next series, That's kind of we are in search, on orders of the White Guardian, we are in search with the Doctor and Romana for the key to time. It's the first series-long story arc, one of only, like, two in the classic run. Um, and I'm interested to see what your thoughts are on it. Uh, kicking off with a reboss operation, which is already downstairs, ready to watch. Uh, as for you guys, what do you think of season 15 of Doctor Who? Were you as disappointed in it as we were? Uh, do you think we've uh, underappreciated some stories? Do you feel like you wish we enjoyed those stories a bit more? Do you hate Underworld more than we do? Let us know. Do you like Underworld? Tell us why you like it. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> and myself, not Chris, and Minnie, probably. We'll be back in a few weeks. Probably quite soon. Bye, Leela. Bye, canine. Hey, Minnie. Are you also a dog? You are that chocolate, but you can't have it. It's not his catchphrase. <laughs>